hay um, Tema Mercado, also known as Bianca Mercado, and I've been invited by Rhonda for the Center of Indigenous Midwifery to share with you all today. Um, we didn't decide on a particular topic. Um, we just decided I wanted, I named it Partera Reflections because I really wanted it to be that. Um, so before we get started, we'll open up with a small prayer um, and um, pray that all the retrograding planets don't mess up our <laughs> transmission here. Um, so Aho um, Creator, we thank you for this um, new day of life, for our lives, for the lives growing inside of us, for all the lives who have come and all those that are um, coming. Um, creator, I thank you for this virtual space that has been created um, for us as um, indigenous birthing people, um, people who are supporting, supporting um, in our best ways and trying to reclaim and practice our indigenous birthing ways and child rearing ways. Creator, I ask you to guide me right now with the, um, the words and the thoughts and the uh, to bring a good feeling, you know, to all who come to hear this um, Zoomcast podcast, either right now live or whenever. Um, creator, I ask you to um, help me here, you know, help me out a little bit here to um, share something that might be meaningful, that will touch um, the hearts of people who are listening and the hearts of people who are being cared by those listening creator. I ask you to send a special blessing across time and space to all of those who we hold near and dear, birthing and growing and developing creator. I say that in a good way. Please take care of anything that I have forgotten to mention. So one song ago, there was a village and this village was pretty secluded because it hadn't been too long from the last, like, ice age melting so there was still you know villages were very like far apart still and this village had everything it needed to try to thrive it had a large fresh water lake that supplied the village with all the fish that that they needed to thrive and they lived very simply and they were thriving and they were growing in numbers, you know, slowly and steadily. And there was very specific rules that everybody had to abide one, ab abide by. And one of the rules was that you were not allowed to go swimming in the lake because there in the lake lived a monster. And this monster was kept at, at peace because the fishermen who were the only people who were allowed to go near the lake would supply at every solstice and at every equinox the monster with goat offerings different types of um, land animal offerings and in return the monster agreed not to eat up all the fish so that the village could thrive and it also agreed not to eat the people so as long they didn't go into the water and swim so we had a village with only about 10 fishermen who could go in canoes and fish but nobody knew how to swim and so every spring there was a rite of passage ceremony for all of the people all of the young women who had had their first bleed and for all of the young men who had successfully hunted and killed their first game. And this was like the party of parties for the village because since their survival um, was dependent on healthy young people who would make more healthy young babies, you know, this was a, a, a big celebration. And so this one spring, there was three girls 
who were over the moon because they had had their first lead and they were ready to, to be celebrated. And there was another girl who was about a year older than them. It was really sad because she had not yet had her first bleed. And she wanted so bad to be accepted by these other girls who were the closest to her in age, but who had always shunned her away because she was a little different. She loved spending time with her grandmother. Um, she was just a little odd in their eyes. But that night before the first day of the celebration, she bled for the first time. And her grandmother ran to the council and said, my granddaughter deserves to be celebrated. She has had her first bleed. And so the council agreed that she did not have to wait a full year, that she too could be celebrated. And part of this rite of passage meant that the matriarch of the family would take off her necklace and bestow it upon the new maiden and would put it over her. And they would do this in the most beautiful ceremonial way. And these necklaces were so important because they were held in the family from the very, very first person in, 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 that, in, that, in that family. And each bead was really special. Some of the beads were made out of seed. Some of them were made out of hair even, um, stones, um, different types of herbs. They were just very intrinsic. And this young girl who had bled for the first time it happened that her family necklace was stunning. It shimmered and it shined and it was just so beautiful. And in that family, there was weavers. In that family, there were singers and healers. And those beads came from those women who had once been matriarchs in the family. And so the four girls and several young men received their blessing and their bestowing. And when the girls received their necklace, they were told, you need to guard this with your life and you're gonna wear it for four days. And in these four days of celebration, you're gonna receive all of the gifts and blessings that the women in our lineage have intended for you so that you know what to do and how to be in this life. And so, they were to wear the necklaces and not take them off, take really good care of them. And this young, naive girl was like, yes, I'm like finally in. These girls, the, those three other girls are finally gonna accept me because I'm like them now and, and I have a nice necklace. But the girls were a little jealous. And they were upset because that other girl kind of stole their thunder because their necklaces wasn't as nice. And now they have to share their whole celebration with this girl, this odd girl. And so for three days, they ignored her. And they did not partake in any of the celebration with her. And on the fourth day, the girl was wandering around by herself and trying to find the girls and she couldn't find the girls. Finally, she heard them what seemed like they were laughing or something. And so she followed and followed and she found them near the lake. And she thought to herself, they can't be by the lake because we're not allowed to go by the lake. But she kept on hearing them. And as she got closer and closer, she realized that they weren't laughing, they were, they were crying and they were sobbing and crying. And on top of that, their necklaces were gone. And the naive girl says, what, what happened? Why are you crying? Why are you by the lake? 
we should be here. <gasps> Where are your necklaces? What happened to your necklace? And the girls cried and the meanest of them all looks at her and says, don't you see? We had to sacrifice our necklaces and offer them to the monster because this year's offerings weren't good enough. And the monster warned us that there would not be enough fish to feed our families to get us through the summer and through the winter months if we did not make a significant offering. So we had to give up our necklaces. And they bowed their heads and cried and cried. And the naive girl took off her necklace and said, I, I am going to, to do the same. And she got her necklace and she spun it round and round and she threw it as far as she could into the lake. And before the necklace could even hit the water, the girls began to cackle. Oh, <laughs> you stupid girl. Didn't you learn anything? You are to never give up your necklace. And they dug into the shore and pulled out their necklaces where they had hit them to trick the girl. And they laughed at her and left her there as she stood there in disbelief and shock. And she just knew that she could not return to her village because she had disobeyed her grandmother and she had sacrificed all those blessings and all those teachings that were woven into that necklace. And her shame and her guilt led her to leave. And she went past the lake into a forbidden forest that not even the hunters had ever gone into. Fortunately for her, there was a full moon that night so she could see through the night as she was wandering almost sleepwalking like a zombie, hungry, cold, and alone. And she really didn't know what she was gonna do. She just knew that she could not go back. But sometime around two or three o'clock in the morning, you know, that really special kind of time of the night, you know, you ever find yourself awake during that time and you go outside you know it's a special time there's things that are happening out there special things that you also need to be careful with well right around that time she sees a flicker fl fire and there's a fire straight up ahead and all of a sudden she has this hope she says, well, maybe I could offer myself to whomever that person is there or whomever, the, if it's a village, maybe I can convince them to take me in. And so she had all this hope and she recited in her head all the things that she would tell whomever she found at that fire. I can sew, I can cook, I can clean, I can fetch wood, I can build a fire. I just need a place where I could be warm and fed. Maybe I don't have to die by myself here in the forest. And so she's getting closer and closer and she realizes that there's only one person there sitting by the fire. And this person is cloaked. And she gets closer and closer. And as soon as she gets close enough to see who is sitting on that fire, she looks and she realizes, oh my God, what, like, what am I getting myself into? She saw the face of an old, old person, looked like a woman, covered in wounds, open, gashing wounds, and just, she looked really horrid and disgusting, and, and, and her flesh was rotting, and you, can, you could smell it. She looked diseased. And so the girl started to step back, afraid, 
but it was too late. The old woman saw her and she said, who goes there? You, you, I see you. Don't step away, come closer. Something has led you to my fire. What is going on, dearie? Why are you here, child? And the young girl says, well, you know, and she goes on and tells her the story. This awful thing happened to me. I can never go back. I just, I'm going to die if, if you don't take me in, if you don't help me out. And the old woman says, huh, is that all? Is that all? Well, don't fret, my dear. I have a solution for you. You do? Yes, I have a solution for you. There is a remedy for this and I can help you with it. How are you gonna help me with this? Well, you see, um, I have an understanding with that monster, that creature. We're actually old friends and I can get your necklace back. But you do have to give me something in return. And the young girl says, well, yes, I'll give you anything. If you can give me my necklace back, then I can go back into my village and it'll be all, all good. And she says, okay. And the girl says, I can clean for you. I can cook for you. I can do your fire. What would you like for me to do? None of that is necessary. I just need for you to, clip, to kiss and lick every single one of my open wounds. And the girl just freezes with shock and disgust. Well, I, I, I can't do, I, wh what do you mean kiss and lick your wounds? I need your help. Would you help me heal my wounds by kissing and licking them? in return for my assistance with your necklace. And the girl just, you know, wanted to say no, but saw this old grandmother and felt so much compassion for her. And at the same time, she was ready to die. So licking wounds and rotting flesh actually didn't seem as, as bad as dying alone in the, wood, in the woods without her village and her grandmother. So she said, yes, grandmother, I will kiss and lick every single one of your wounds as you wish. So she begins, she begins, and if the taste and the stench of the rotting wounds weren't bad enough, what were really, what was really even worse was that every time she kissed and licked a wound, the old grandmother would yell out and cry, oh, 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 I feel so much better now, thank you. And with every single kiss and lick, the grandmother would wail out in pain and then express her relief. And this happened all throughout the night, just before that sun began to rise. And after the young girl was done, she looks at the grandmother and she says, wiping off the flesh, grandmother, I have done as you've said. Will you help me now? And the grandmother says, oh, thank you, dear. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel so much better. I feel renewed. Before I'm able to get your necklace back, I, I just forgot to ask you one question, dear. What is it, grandmother? Do you know how to swim? And before the young girl could answer, the grandmother picks up the girl with this enormous force and begins to swirl her around, round and round by her head and tosses her over the forest trees and straight into the lake. 
And as the girl is falling down into the lake, even before hitting the water, she thinks, oh no, I've been fooled again. And she resigns to her death because she knows that she cannot breathe. If she's able to withstand the impact of the fall into the water, she still won't survive because she can't swim and she can't breathe underwater. And maybe the monster will find her and eat her then. And so as she falls into the water, and she's holding her breath and she's falling and finally you know she doesn't have any more breath inside of her she <gasps> gasps expecting to have her lungs filled with water instead she realizes she uh, somehow by some sort of miracle can breathe underwater and she's breathing and she's breathing and she's looking around and she says, well, I can breathe underwater, but this monster is going to find me and this monster is going to eat me. This is the agreement the monster has with her village. But no monster comes. Instead, another old woman who looks just like the one in the forest, except for this one doesn't have any wounds, comes to her aid and says, Oh dear, I've been waiting for you. Come here. I have something that belongs to you. And she pulls out the young girl's necklace, except this time it's even more beautiful, more shiny, more luminescent. It looks like there's starlight inside of the beads. And she says, I want to thank you for helping my sister in the woods. Let me give you your necklace back. And she puts the necklace on the young girl and she grabs her and gently pushes her up in the water, kissing her from head to toe, sending her back up to the shore with her new beautiful necklace. And as she rises out of the lake and crawls onto the shore, the sun is beginning to rise. And she starts running towards the village. And when people see her, they're like flabbergasted, like, where have you been? And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I ran away last night, but now I'm, I'm, I'm back and, and look, my necklace. And the grandmother says, child, you haven't been gone one night. It's been a year. And the girl's like, what? What do you mean it's been a year? And then those three girls come by and they look at her and they say, where did you get your necklace? Where did you get your necklace? We saw you. We saw you throw it into the lake. And the young naive girl says, well, you know, uh, well, I threw it into the lake and then I ran into the forest and there was this old woman. And then she, she, she took me to her sister in the lake and the, the, the monster wasn't there. The monster didn't eat me and now I have this necklace. And the three girls go to the lake, take off their necklace, throw it into the lake, run into the woods and find the old lady. And everything goes just as it had for the first girl, except that when the grandmother asked for her wounds to be licked and kissed, they said, ill, no, gross. There's no way, you're just disgusting. We're not gonna do that. We want our new bright, shiny necklace. So the grandmother said, okay, do you know how to swim? She tosses them into the lake, but there's no sister to greet them. There's no new shiny necklace. Monster comes and fulfills his agreement that he's had with the village for decades. And that's the story of La Mera Mera, the be all, the, the mighty, the great.
And so I ask you not who you identify to, because this changes depending on where you are in your life, in your journey. You might identify with that naive girl, but the truth is, is that we're every single one of those characters. We're the naive girl. We are the old woman in the forest, full of wounds who need support to heal them. We're the beautiful, wombless water lady. Sometimes we're even the monster and the jealous girls. And so I wanna close by saying, protect your legacy necklaces. It might not be as beautiful as your friends, as a luminescent, but those are your gifts. Those are your blessings that were intended for you and for your lineage. Aho, Mateo, blessings to you in everything you do. And I thank you for being a part of this um, Zoom test. <laughs>